This is 500 FPS in Valorant, 400 FPS in Fortnite, and this? That's 400 FPS at 1440p. These numbers are already insane, but what if I told you all of this was on a $20 GPU? Yeah, I wouldn't believe it either. See, when I first got into PC gaming, I was actually gaming on a $20 GPU, the GT710. It gave me some great memories as a kid, but let's be real, it's garbage. 17 FPS in the Fortnite lobby, don't even ask about actual gameplay. But you might be wondering, how is this $20 GT710 supposed to get 500 FPS? Well it's not, because this isn't the GPU I bought for today's video. It's actually the reason I'm buying a new $20 GPU to get 500 FPS. Here's the thing, last week my dad finally revealed the truth about the 710. We didn't buy this for $20 like I thought we did. We paid $60, three times what it's worth for a GPU that was obsolete the day it launched. We wasted $40 for no reason, and I wasn't letting that slide. So in this video, I went on a quest to find the fastest $20 GPU in the world, and without spoiling too much, this might be the only GPU worth buying today. Now in order to find a GPU at this price, let alone one that can actually hit these kinds of numbers, I had to shop the used market. Because not even a GT210 can be found for $20 brand new. But this was actually a good thing, because on the used market you can often find whatever you're looking for for a fraction of its price. And because I live in Canada, people are nice, meaning that I can negotiate with people to drop their prices. And as a professional lowballer, I know a lot about negotiating. But on a serious note, the problem with local marketplaces is that you have to meet up in person. And well, I don't have a car because I'm broke. Even if I did, I live way out in the middle of nowhere. So the cost of gas to meet these people would end up being more than the GPU itself. So at this point, I knew I had to get one shipped to my house. The only issue with that is that I now have to factor a shipping cost into my budget. So realistically, we're going to be spending about $30 or $42.71 in Canadian doubloons. My wallet's going to weigh negative 20 grams after this. Oh wait, it already does. After finding some GPUs to shit- After finding some GPUs to ship to my house, for some reason nobody on this website knows how to calculate shipping prices. F do you mean you have no clue? Just fucking enter the dimensions and send me the price. Do you not want to sell the fucking GPU or is the listing just for show? And this absolute clown thinks I'm gonna put a down payment of $33 plus tax and then get the difference paid back to me. What is this kid talking about? So these Canadians might be nice, but it seems like none of these 40 year old men have even graduated high school. So instead of shopping locally, I have to resort to the next best option, eBay. Normally I avoid eBay since the prices are a little bit steeper, but just as I was searching around, I got this comment from Beanman123, where he recommended the Nvidia Quadro K4200 or K2200 as these are some of the fastest $20 GPUs. The one I'm most interested in is the K4200. Having 4GB of VRAM and 1344 CUDA cores, there is no $20 GPU that can even come close to it. Shockingly enough, it comes very close to the $90 1650 Super if we're just looking at core counts and memory capacity. And to my surprise, I instantly found a listing up for just $21 plus shipping, keeping us below the $30 that I expected to spend for the challenge, so I immediately took it. But of course, with such a great price, there had to be a catch. No returns allowed. Unfortunately, I already bought the GPU just now, so I just have to hope that it works. While we wait for the K4200 to arrive at my house, here's a quick word from today's sponsor. This is the C7 ergonomic chair. I spend hours upon hours gaming, recording, and editing while sitting down, so it is important for me to have a comfortable seat to sit on. This was my old chair, and though it was amazing for the price, the C7 makes it look like cheeks. It includes all the adjustability you could ever ask for. Literally everything in this chair is adjustable. This is probably the best design lumbar support I've probably ever used, because my last one was kind of stiff, and I ended up using a pillow to compensate for it. It's built with an ergonomic design that keeps your posture in check, and its premium materials make it as durable as it is comfortable. You can choose between multiple different colors and seat materials as well. And of course, with such a nice chair, I had to upgrade my desk, and no matter how good your chair is, it's a good idea to stand up every once in a while. So I got the E7 Pro standing desk with me, and unlike those cheap desks made of light and flimsy aluminum, the frame is made of automotive grade steel and thick legs, making this the sturdiest desk I've ever used. If you're looking to upgrade your setup, be sure to check out the FlexiSpot C7 chair and E7 Pro desk, and use my exclusive discount codes for $50 off each of these products. Alright, it is now February 18th. The GPU was delivered on the 11th, less than 24 hours after I bought it, but I haven't bothered to open up the package until now. 
so it's time to see if it works. It was packed in quite the small bag, which makes a lot of sense because the shipping was so cheap, but the GPU's actual condition is atrociously bad, worse than anything I've ever bought on any website. I did expect the several scratches that you can see here, but in the photos it wasn't very clear that there was a whole dent in the heatsink. But despite these huge problems, the worst was yet to come. But speaking of huge, it's also surprisingly very large, probably one of the biggest $20 GPUs you can buy today. It's around twice the size of the AMD Fire Pro W4100 and about three times bigger than the R5 340X. Now before I bought the GPU, I knew it was going to be very powerful, so I was going to put it in my main PC regardless of whether or not it fit into this Dell Optiplex. This way, there's absolutely no chance that this GPU gets bottlenecked in even the most CPU demanding games. Everything looked fine, except I ran into probably the strangest PC problem I've run into since I started doing these videos, and this is a pretty big statement considering that my PC has a really bad dandruff problem. Yeah, I can't breathe within a 5 km radius of this thing. When I pressed the power button on the front of my PC, it turned on and the fans did spin, which usually means that it's working. But just as I was about to celebrate, I noticed that nothing was posting. I tried a few more times, and still nothing was happening on my screen. Was the GPU broken? Well, it was definitely looking like it, because I've been trying for the past 30 minutes and still nothing showed up. To determine if it was truly a GPU error, I thought it would be a good idea to try booting up using integrated graphics and install the graphics drivers for the K4200 and then reboot the PC. But no matter what I did, my system just doesn't turn on when the GPU is plugged in. My keyboard doesn't even turn on either. It lights up for a split second, then turns back off again, implying that my computer is in a power cycling loop. Apparently, having my GPU connected to my monitors just stops my entire computer from doing anything other than spin the fans. After about an hour of messing around, I went down into my basement to find a different power connector. But not only would that be a stupid thing to try, but I also couldn't find the power connector that I wanted. However, this led to me finding the weirdest possible solution to my problem. You see, this GPU has two types of connectors, DisplayPort and DVI, and the only thing I didn't try yet was connecting it using DVI, because these monitors are too new to even have DVI ports. And so I picked up this LG Twin Towers monitor from the basement and fingered it into my GPU, huh? and to nobody's surprise, it just worked. And to make things weirder, connecting my other two monitors after turning on the computer also just worked. Regardless, now that it's finally working, it's time to put this GPU to the test. I've lined up a mix of competitive and AAA games to see just how well it performs across a variety of titles. Let's start off with the competitive games to warm up the GPU before we put it through some of the more demanding games on the list. In Fortnite on a blank FPS map, we are seeing a maximum of about 400 frames per second, which is incredibly good for a $20 graphics card. In actual in-game situations, I was seeing around 140 FPS in fights and above 200 FPS outside of them. Obviously, most of the work is being done on the CPU, but that is not to say that this game is not also dependent on the GPU, especially when we're talking about max FPS. Next, I think it would be a good idea to follow up with Counter-Strike 2, currently the second most popular game in the world. I'm getting anywhere between 55 and 80 FPS in combat, closer to 65 and 90 when I'm not recording, and in some situations, it can reach as high as 100. But if you want to get 100 FPS consistent in any situation, you're definitely going to have to drop your resolution. Next up is Valorant, which is also a very CPU intensive game, this time to the point where a GT710 would actually be able to run it. But with this GPU, we're seeing anywhere between 400 and 540 FPS at 1080p. In 1440p, it didn't drop nearly as much as I expected, and you can still get very competitive frame rates with the K4200. And just before we get into the AAA GPU intensive games, we have Rocket League, and in this game, we are maintaining above 200 FPS while recording, and it stays well above 200 if I'm not. With all the multiplayer games out the way, it's finally time for some AAA single player games to really stress out this GPU. We're gonna warm up the 4200 with Tomb Raider, which is still fairly demanding at ultimate settings, so we're gonna be a bit humble today and stick with a high preset. Coming in with an average of 98 FPS at 1080p high settings, this was exceptional, especially compared to my previous fastest $20 GPU, the AMD W4100. Following Tomb Raider, it would only make sense to continue with the next game in the trilogy, and here we are getting 46 FPS on 1080p high settings. Still amazing for a $20 graphics card, but it's up to you to decide if it's still playable or not. And to wrap up the Tomb Raider trilogy, we have Shadow of the Tomb Raider and we're still pulling over 30 FPS on the 1080p high preset. You might not be able to hit any fast flicks at this frame rate, but you're still going to be able to make it to the end of the game like this. Unfortunately, the GPU kind of just stops working with Cyberpunk 2077. I'm not sure why it doesn't render anything since the K4200 does have new enough drivers to run the game, but here's this other guy's benchmark since I couldn't find a way to get my card to work. 
So yeah, the K4200 is definitely the fastest $20 GPU, but if you're looking to play the newest AAA titles on a budget, spend the extra 20 bucks for an RX 580 and you'll have a much better time. But if you want to see me optimize my PC until I get 1000 FPS, watch this video next.